And now, ladies and gentlemen, as pastor of the Landmark Temple and director of the Landmark Hour, I count it a high honor and a privilege to bring to our pulpit and to our listening audience today the ministry of Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. Thank you, Brother Rawlings. We consider it a real privilege to have a chance to preach in the Landmark Hour to millions of listeners across the country. And, of course, it's fitting and proper that we should relate the Bible to each event that comes up currently. For the Christian, the Bible is the textbook of absolute truth. All things will be judged by this standard according to the child of God. Now, we realize the world doesn't like this, and they resent it. We realize that many of the educated people in America today resent very deeply and very bitterly us Christian people drawing judgment on everything that comes up by laying it alongside an absolute standard. Now, recently, there's been a great deal of publicity given to a teenage uh, African musical called Jesus Christ Superstar. The question arises, according to the Word of God, what is this? Now, of course, that's how the Christian looks at it. The unsaved man is his own absolute authority, so he simply judges by whatever he thinks. But we Christians have a more sure word of prophecy, wherein do we do well to take heed. We have a rock and a sure foundation. And Isaiah said, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. We have a word by which to judge things, a revelation from God. And when something comes up, thank God we have more uh, brains that are more reliable than our own. As a famous Englishman once said to an atheist, he said, I thank God I have somebody more reliable to lean upon than myself. And so when these things come up, we get out the standard and see what the standard says about them. For example, if a new fad comes through like the limbo or the rock or the rock and the roll or the frog or the frug or the dog or the animal, whatever you want to call it, we simply draw out the ruler and measure it. And it does the judging. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about the positive things in regards to the play Jesus Superstar, and then I'm going to speak about the negative things. My text for this exposition is found in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, the gospel which he delivered and preached to the Christians was this, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, I emphasize this because Paul said very strongly, in no uncertain terms, in Galatians chapter 1, that if any man preach any other gospel than that, let him be accursed. Now, isn't that rather strong language? Paul said, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that, let God curse him. How's that for bigotry? Speaking positively, there are four good things about this rock opera. In the first place, it will gross millions of dollars. Americans will always consider that a good thing. If a thing sells and goes over good in America, they consider it to be good. There's no doubt about it, it will gross millions of the players of this uh, cheap juvenile production. Uh, It may be said the same thing that was said of the Beatles. When the Beatles went back to England, somebody was commenting upon their dirty, depraved filth, and they said, yeah, it really grieved us to hear people talk like that. We wept all the way to the bank. There are some people who do anything for a dollar. And this play will undoubtedly gross millions of dollars. It's good business. It won't probably gross as much as Cleopatra, or A.B.'s Irish Rose, which has been playing on Broadway for more than 30 years. But it'll do pretty good. Number two, it will cause much discussion. It will stir up a lot of controversy and a lot of thought and a lot of argumentation. That's probably good. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, we read that the Athenians, the highbrows, the cultured scholars of their day and time, wanted to do nothing except hear or tell something new. And there always have been much of cheap opportunists who will grab at anything new and make a dollar off it and spread it around just to get people talking for publicity. So we may say this play will certainly gross millions of dollars. It will cause a great deal of discussion. And number three, it will help promote African music. There's no doubt about that. It is African music from start to finish. And, of course, any musician knows that as well as he knows his own name. I suppose it's good for the business world and the music world to be able to sell a bunch of records, and it will sell a bunch of records. We may say positively, it will help the uh, economy. Number four, 
It will acquaint many heathen people in America with four biblical names. There are people in America who, ne- who don't know about Mary Magdalene and Pontius Pilate and Judas and Herod. And they'll become acquainted with these names. They've been barred from the Bible for the purposes of opportunist appropriation and used in this play called Jesus Christ Superstar. I suppose some knowledge is better than none at all, and it uh, might be of some benefit that the great heathen populace in pagan America would become acquainted with some biblical characters, uh, I should say their names, for there are no biblical characters in the play Jesus Christ Superstar. There are no biblical characters in the entire play. The characters in the play are the manufactured fantasy of a teenage mind. There are no biblical characters in the play. Now, the names have been borrowed. This brings us to certain negative considerations, of which I shall discuss. Now, speaking negatively, there are four things about this play that make it uh, very negative, this opera. Number one, the biggest failure about Jesus Christ Superstar is in telling it like it is. With all the sex-crazy, sex-obsessional neurotics involved in the hippie rock and roll movement and in this movement, they keep talking about tell it like it is, tell it like it is, meaning let's talk about sex. You'd think that people that were that pornographic and that crude and uncouth in plain presentation of sex facts You'd think they'd be real outspoken in telling the truth, wouldn't you? But they're not. They're not. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ Superstar is telling it exactly like it ain't. Now, the man who put this thing together said of this production, and this is Tim Rice, quoting from the magazine 17 in March of 71, Although the Gospels seem largely accurate in their telling of the events of the crucifixion, one can see great flaws in their portrayals of both Christ and Judas. Really? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were eyewitnesses. Now, imagine some pipsqueak up in the 20th century saying, although they seem largely accurate, one can see great flaws. Well, (laughs) you've got better eyes than an eyewitness, honey. You must be somebody. You know something? In a law court, you'd go to jail. In an inquiry of truth, your case wouldn't stand. In an inquiry of truth, the testimony of one or more eyewitnesses, unless it's successfully refuted at that time or successfully controverted after it's been reduced to written testimony, it cannot be overthrown. That's the laws of jurisprudence of the United States. So the main failure of Jesus Christ Superstar is the fact that it's blatant perversion of the truth by a man who doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the main thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote scriptural accounts as eyewitnesses of the events. The men who concocted uh, Superstar simply ignored the eyewitness. They didn't tell it like it was. They tell it like they hoped it would be to make a good income. They didn't tell it like it was. For example, I mean, this is just one example of the pitiful uh, type of lying going on in the picture. They have Mary Magdalene breaking the alabaster box and anointing Christ before his burial, and Mary Magdalene wasn't even there. The woman that did this was Mary of Bethany. Imagine a man saying there are flaws in the Bible account and he doesn't even know who the characters are. There was a sinful woman that anointed Christ's feet over there earlier in Luke, but it wasn't said she was Mary Magdalene. And that wasn't the occasion before the Last Supper of Mary of Bethany. You talk about great flaws in the Bible accounts while the eyewitnesses clearly distinguish between Mary and the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of Joseph and uh, Christ's uh, uh, cousins, Mary Cleopas, and clearly distinguishes between Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany and another woman who anointed Christ's feet and washed his feet when he was eating with a Pharisee. And imagine some run of a teenage pipsqueak in the 20th century who wasn't even there saying the account should be corrected and then making a boner like that. 
So the first outstanding thing about Jesus Christ Superstar is nobody tells anything like it is. They don't even know what it is. All right, the second failure. The second failure, and it's a glaring travesty of common sense, is the title has nothing to do with the plot. Here's a play called Jesus Christ Superstar, and there's nothing in the plot that would indicate he was a superstar or anybody would want him for a superstar. While the character of Christ in Jesus Christ Superstar is not the character of a superstar, it's the character of a confused, bewildered, neurotic infant. I've got the script right here in the pulpit in front of me. I've read it six times. Don't tell me what's in it. I'll tell you what's in it. Why, the title Jesus Christ Superstar is not the name of this opera. The name of this opera should be The Lost Babes in the Woods or Alice in Wonderland. That's a much more fitting title. Or perhaps Judas and the Wizard of Oz. That might be a good title. There's no superstar in the opera Jesus Christ Superstar. There's nothing in the character of Christ presented in the script I have in front of me that would get me to follow the fellow from here down to the garbage can. The very idea of calling a man a superstar and then presenting a weak, effeminate, neurotic, scared child that a Boy Scout wouldn't follow 15 feet. The opera is plainly wrongly named. There are no superstars in this story. There are no stars in this story. The characters presented in this opera are not worthy of anybody's respect, let alone the respect of a Christian. Why, you'd, be have to, you'd have to be a fool to even want the autograph of the man presented in Jesus Christ Superstar as Jesus. I wouldn't give you 15 cents for his autograph on a baseball. There's no superstar in this story. Read it. It presents a neurotic, frightened, psychotic, false prophet trying to kid himself into what he's doing. You call that a star? You call that a superstar? Why, I have more respect for Bronco Nagurski than for a character like that. The opera is wrongly named. It has no star. If it has a star, it's Judas, and Judas is not a superstar. All right, the third thing wrong with this opera. There are no men in the opera. There are no manly men anywhere in the, in the entire story. Tim Rice says, quote, If I draw a parallel between Christ and someone like Martin Luther King, that, it, that isn't to say that I regard King as a god, but that I regard Christ as a man. Why, there is no man in this play. Tim Rice said in the Cincinnati Post, July 9, 1971, we simply wanted to tell the story of the last week in Christ's life musically as accurately as, as, accurately as possible. The story of Christ as a man rather than as a God. Well, there's no man in this play. I've read this play. These uh, subconscious uh, streams of thought, this flow of consciousness recorded here, these aren't the thoughts of a man. Jesus Christ says to Pilate in the musical score, It's you that say I am. I look for truth and find I get damned. No man thinks like that. Those aren't the thoughts of a mature 33-year-old mind, of a man who's been a carpenter for 18 years. Why, aside from the blasphemous implications of the play, speaking from the standpoint of just common sense and down-to-earth horse sense, a 33-year-old man that works as a carpenter for 18 years doesn't think like that. If Christ were only a man, which he was not, but if he was, he wouldn't think like this script has him thinking. Here's another sample. Then I was inspired, now I'm sad and tired. After all, I've tried for three years, seemed like 90. Why then am I scared to finish what I started? What you started, I didn't start it. Why listen? A grown, mature man doesn't think like that. That's the recording of the subconscious stream of thought of a 12-year-old boppy, teener, teeny, bopper, hippie, flopper. Men don't think like that. 
Judah says, I am frightened by the crowd, for we are getting much too loud. <laughs> well, isn't that sweet? You think a man thinks that way? Why, we know a man didn't write this script because nobody in this script thinks like a man. Pilate says, And next the room was full of wild and angry men. They seemed to hate this man. They fell on him, and then they disappeared again. But da ti ta ti ta ti ta ti ta ti ta ti ta ta Goldilocks and the three bears. There are no men in this script. Judas is not presented as a man. He's a child. Herod says, Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. <laughs> men don't think like that. Judas says in the play, I don't know how to love him. I don't know why he moves me. He's a man. He's just a man. He's not a king. He's just the same as anyone knows. He scares me so. Well, put on my purse and beads, honey. That's no man. The very idea of saying you're going to present an opera to present Christ as a man, there's no man in this script. These are children. These are naive, juvenile, unrealistic children in a fantasy. And it's a crude fantasy that divorces it from being real in any sense of the word. Number four. Although the writer borrowed biblical names, none of his music, plot, characters, dialogue, or philosophy are biblical. Isn't it interesting to notice that the first rock opera ever produced was an attack on the Holy Spirit? Did you ever stop to think about that? The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John write, they write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And some jaded little dope head of a situation ethics pipsqueak pops up and says, There are many flaws in the character. There are many flaws in the portrayal. And then he turns all these characters into neurotic, psychotic, Teenage kiddies. There are no biblical characters in this opera. There's no biblical music. There's no biblical plot. There's no biblical dialogue. And the philosophy behind the portrayal of characters is non-biblical. The only things biblical in the whole opera were the names that were borrowed. The danger of this opera lies in the fact that it is an out-and-out out misrepresentation of fact and should be treated exactly as you treat Alice in Wonderland or the Wizard of Oz. It not only refuses to present Jesus Christ as a man, it doesn't even present Pilate as a man or Herod as a man. It is not merely inaccurate. It is sheer fantasy. It is not the work of a mature mind. And it is not the work of anybody who knows anything about human nature. Human nature is not found in the life of Christ in the dialogue, nor is it found in the life of Herod, Pilate, or Judas, or the apostles. Jesus Christ Superstar is like the yellow submarine. It's pure pagan fantasy. And as such, it may enjoy a certain niche of respect in the idea of pagan people who enjoy fantasy. It may allow a certain release of certain tensions from reality by people who are too immature and naive to be able to live with reality. But from the standpoint of the Bible or truth or fact, no sober man could possibly take the work seriously for 15 seconds. It is childish fantasy and should be classed in a bracket with Porky Pig and Charlie Brown. Now, in closing, may I tell you what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, the star of stars? Well, the Bible calls him the bright and morning star. The Bible calls him the day star. And to stoop to such a diminutive as superstar would be unworthy of the Holy Spirit. Before the Holy Spirit would bow down in the dirt and lower his glory to that of somebody like Joe Namath, a rackle Welsh, the Holy Spirit has written, He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the bright and morning star, the bread of life, the water of life, 
the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, the fairest of ten thousand, my friend, my beloved, the seed of woman, the seed of David, the king of Israel, the king of the Jews, God Almighty, the day star, the way, the truth, the life, God, the Lord God, the everlasting Father, wonderful, counselor, the Prince of Peace, the door, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the first and the last, the amen, the true witness, the first begotten of the dead, the resurrection, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God over all, blessed forever. Now those are the facts. <laughs> 